This is Around the A, a weekly look at the top stories, news, and interviews from the NHL's top developmental league with your hosts, David Foote and Patrick Williams on the Sports Podcasting Network. It's episode 23 of Around the A on the Sports Podcasting Network with David Foote and Patrick Williams. Glad to have you back with us again. Uh, Another busy week around the A over the last seven days since our last show. We've got the official name of the new Henderson franchise. We've got the AHL's outstanding rookie and MVP announced. A coaching change out on the West Coast and a whole lot more. We're also going to uh, go back over the results of our playoff poll that we put into action last week as well so uh, lots to get to uh, this week including a chat with the uh, rookie of the year josh norris but first pat we wanted to touch on what's happening down in the states right now Uh, a lot of unrest uh, due to a lot of social issues obviously the killing of george floyd has really sparked a lot of outrage and for good reason across the states how are things uh, out where you are and what type of reaction from around this league and and elsewhere have you seen because of all this? Yeah, uh, it's been quite an outburst of action, I guess you would call it. Uh, The American Hockey League uh, put out a message today on Twitter uh, stating uh, their support uh, for the various causes that are are being discussed, and several teams have done as well, and a number of players. Uh, I think that's been the, the thing that stuck out to me the most is how many players have uh, taken it upon themselves to put their voice to this. Uh, you know, you look at Blake Wheeler uh, from the Winnipeg Jets, put out a uh, pretty forceful message, I would say. Uh, Tyler Seguin, uh, Logan Couture did. Uh, so just a not, lot of big-name players. Often on, in hockey, you hear that uh, players tend to want to shy away from social issues or anything of that nature. In this case, that's not happened at all. Uh, all the clubs and a number of the players have also ventured into this discussion, and uh, it's been pretty Pretty notable the way it's become such a major issue uh, really across the United States but across Canada as well and across uh, you know a lot of ways uh, other parts of the world uh, this issue is just something that players teams and, and hockey itself are not able to ignore and, and should not ignore sports can be a good thing or a bad thing depending on what it's used for and in a lot of ways sports ha- has a as a very large platform and I applaud the leagues and the players uh, for really uh Using some of that that platform to talk about something that's more important than hockey, something that's just uh, you know it's been a plague on society for really as long as you can ever go back. So uh, yeah, it's uh, been it's been really something to watch. I think we've all been glued to our televisions the past week, watching all the events happening. The cities big and small. I mean, you, obviously it's the big cities like uh, Los Angeles, New York, uh, Chicago, but a uh, number of American hockey league cities, kind of those mid-sized cities, uh, your Grand Rapids, your Milwaukee's, uh, places like that have also found themselves in the middle of it. So it's uh, it's really one of those things where you're not able to just ignore it or you know, say it's none of my business. Uh, in this case, uh, it's quite the opposite. And I don't think there's a whole lot more that really we can say from our perspective um, other than that obviously we support the cause and not necessarily the looting and, and things that people are doing to in their minds, you know, get the message across, but uh, all those uh, working towards peaceful protests. Uh, I think to speak for both of us and the show to say we probably align quite closely with the AHL statement uh, with the league saying earlier this week that it stands together with all those who oppose racism and injustice in our society and support building stronger and more inclusive communities with an emphasis on caring and respect. I think that touches all of the points. Before we move on, I would suggest that anybody who who wants to learn more, and really that is, I think, the point of this whole movement, is to learn more and to educate ourselves, go over to sportspodcastingnetwork.com and check out the Scrum podcast done by our friends Julian McKenzie and Tristan Damore. They had a frank, honest, open discussion about what all this means, and I would implore you to go listen to their show and get a little bit more perspective on on everything that's happening right now because it is a difficult time to talk about sports when there's so much else going on, and uh, they decided to take an episode to do just that, talk about this issue. So I would uh, suggest, again, uh, the Scrum Podcast. You can Google it or head over to sportspodcastingnetwork.com and listen to what those guys have to say. Uh, Let's move on to the headlines from this past week, Pat. We will get to Henderson coming up in a little bit. We'll get to our playoff poll in a little bit. 
and the coaching change in Ontario with the rain all coming up. But uh, let's discuss the last two awards handed out by the American Hockey League uh, last week, starting with the MVP going to uh, Jerry Mayhew of the Iowa Wild. Uh, he wins the Les Cunningham Award as the most valuable player, again, as voted on by coaches, players, members of the media. Any surprise for you in this announcement? Uh, a little bit of a surprise, but only because uh, his line mate, uh, Sam Annis, also of the Iowa Wild, uh, led the league in scoring, uh, had a phenomenal year. Really, that whole Iowa club all season long really had such a had such a good thing going. That was a difficult division to be in this season with the Milwaukee Admirals running away early and quite a bit of back pressure from clubs chasing Iowa uh, at one point. But uh, the Iowa Wild, uh, in their own right, had a very successful season, a lot to be proud of there. I, I think you could have flipped a coin on Mayhew versus Annis. Uh, just two two guys that uh, nothing really came easy to them. Mayhew started his career in an AHL contract uh, coming out of college. Uh, Sam Annis, a uh, smaller player, and uh, he had to really grind his way through things and battle back from some injuries. And to his credit, he, he just broke loose this season. Uh, so both of them uh, were phenomenal. Real credit to what that Iowa Wild Club did because – before last season, when they actually made the playoffs, uh, it had been a really tough uh, go of it for a long time for the Minnesota affiliation there. Uh, they just did not win very often. Uh, we're not able to develop a ton of players uh, after they moved from Houston, where they were the Arrows. Had a lot of success over the years, uh, so it was a difficult introduction to Iowa. But uh, the last couple of years, they really turned it around there and uh, started to really uh, turn that franchise into both a good development vehicle for Minnesota, but also a winning uh, operation as well for the fans in Iowa. So uh, full congrats to Jerry Mayhew. Uh, finally got his first NHL crack this season and uh, made everything go. And, and Sam Annis, uh, I'd be interested to see the final tally. I wouldn't be surprised if he was a runner-up. And uh, he's going to be a, a free agent, unrestricted free agent this summer. So uh, I think he'll have a lot of uh, a lot of offers to sift through uh, as he decides if and when uh, he might uh, try a new, new opportunity. So it was a heck of a year in Iowa, and real shame for the Iowa Wild, the Milwaukee Admirals, clubs like that, uh, is that they didn't get a chance to see the season through and uh, see if they could have uh, really done some damage in the postseason. Just to run down Mayhew's resume for the season, a league-best 39 goals, uh, 61 points in 49 games. Ten of his goals were game winners. He had 11 multi-goal games, including a natural hat-trick in which he was the only one to score. 3 nothing win over San Diego on Valentine's Day. Tied a franchise mark with a 10-game scoring streak. Uh, was the player of the month in January. And Jerry Mayhew is your uh, MVP. We should say we are trying to land the MVP for a spot here on, on Around the A. Coming up hopefully next week, so you'll want to stay tuned for that. Uh, we can tell you that coming up in uh, just a couple minutes from now, we will talk to the new outstanding rookie in the American Hockey League, Josh Norris of the Belleville Senators, and uh, we spoke a bit on the show last week about this, Pat. Uh, maybe a little bit of surprise in Jerry Mayhew's win for the MVP. I think absolutely no surprise in uh, Josh Norris picking up the uh, Dudley Red Garrett Memorial Award. No, he, he really had a dream season. Uh, really, that whole Belleville club did. Uh, highest scoring club in the league. Really a kind of go-go approach to the game. Uh, when the puck was on their stick, they were dangerous. Uh, at all three zones of the ice, and uh, that was a fun club to watch. And it w would have been really fun to see them go up against possibly the Providence Bruins, a real good defensive club, or the Hershey Bears, a very similar club in that regard, for the Eastern Conference Final, because uh, it would have been a real clash of styles. And, you know, the old saying, styles make good fights, uh, would have definitely been uh, applicable here. But uh, Josh Norris uh, was right at the forefront there, along with Jake Bat Batherson and Adam Sorrent, and uh, just a real impressive year. Obviously, as a first round pick, he comes in. Uh, with with a lot of expectations and hype, and uh, it's not easy to, to not only match those expectations but to surpass them. And he managed to do just that and all year long. It was a real, real exciting club, and he was the obvious choice. I think uh, you can make an argument uh, for the Providence Bruins, uh, Jack Stanitra. He was really good this year. He really headed up that Providence penalty kill. So dangerous at different points of year. He led the league seven shorthanded goals, but uh, Norris. It's hard to say no to that. Yeah, 31 goals, 61 points for him in 56 games. Uh, tied for third in the overall scoring race, which is uh, the highest finish uh, there by an AHL rookie since Corey Conacher was second in 2011-12. Uh, Norris made his NHL debut with Ottawa, played just a handful of games there with the Senators, and uh, created some headlines as well because Bobby Ryan 
there was a lot of talk about his comeback from his personal issues and came back, scored a hat trick in uh, that game that was Norris's debut. Ryan scored an empty netter for the hat trick, and right before that, Norris was there clapping his stick on the ice, uh, wanting the puck <laughs> to put it into the empty net. And uh, he took a little bit of heat from his teammates uh, for that, but uh, yeah, made the uh, NHL debut. And um, you know, without Josh Norris. I don't think the Belleville Senators have anywhere near the amount of success that they saw this season. Yeah, absolutely. That that was a funny uh, that was a funny moment. I, mean, I think you just chalked that up to youth and nerves and uh, everything that comes with that. But really, a dream year for him. And full full credit to him. He embraced going down there and handling that that opportunity. A lot of players, especially first round picks, don't always go down to the American League uh, with the right mindset. Uh, but he certainly did. And as a result, he has a 31 goal season. And that looks great at any level uh, for a player. And I think uh, he is every chance to make Ottawa uh, next season. A big challenge for him now is just to have a really good summer off season, take care of himself, uh, you know, from a conditioning standpoint, which will not be easy for a lot of players, given both the long off season and the uncertain start time and the lack of access to facilities and ice and some cases. So that's a challenge for him and really other, any other young player in the league. But uh, yeah, uh, what a great first season for him. Yeah, incredible run for Josh Norris. Uh, let's find out how he plans to get back in that off season rhythm and uh, a little bit more about what led to his success in his first pro season. The former University of Michigan Wolverine joins us next on episode 23 of Around the Edge. Thanks for doing this, Josh. How are you, man? Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. How's it going? We'll, uh, we'll get into the season here in, in just a moment, but it's been a few w- months now since things kind of abruptly stopped. How have you been spending your uh, quarantine time uh, over the last little while? Yeah, it's been good. i um, just been home with my family in the Detroit area, and uh, yeah, kind of just been hanging out with them and doing some home workouts and things like that, so it's been good. What are things like around that area of the country right now? It's pretty wild times, uh, you know, on a lot of different uh, different facets, but what are things like where you are? Um, I mean, where I am, it's, I think it's pretty mild. I think there have been some protests, um, you know, around the state in Detroit and in Grand Rapids, and I think Lansing is also... Um, that's been obviously a little bit than normal times, but, um, where I am, it's, it's pretty quiet. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about hockey mentioned the, the incredible season that you had. We talked about this last week in our little interview. How did this year match up to your expectations for your first pro campaign? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I was able to find success this year and, um, you know, being my first year pro, um, I think I had a, a lot of really good people around me and, um, you know, tried not to have too many expectations going into the season, just with, um, you know, obviously coming off shoulder surgery last, um, you know, off season and just, uh, go- going to my first angel camp, didn't really know what to expect. So, um, you know, I just tried to work hard and have fun. And obviously, like I said, uh, it was able to play a pretty big role in Belleville and Manor trusted me a lot. So, um, just kind of, you know, ran with it. Yeah. What was it like to uh, play for a coach like Troy Mann, who obviously, uh, is not afraid to put his young guys uh, in all kinds of different scenarios, and and how did he perhaps uh, help with your development over the course of the season? I think I found that out probably when he put me on the penalty kill, and I think it was probably January. You know, so obviously I, I knew that he trusted me then, but um, you know, obviously he was was able to play with Batherson and you know Abramov and Balzers and you know some other guys that helped me out a lot. Um, but yeah, Manor was was great for me. We had a really good relationship. Um, you know, trusted me a lot. Um, you know, really helped me with, with my development as a young pro, so I, I appreciate him a lot. You mentioned Drake Batherson. Uh, I know you guys developed a pretty good friendship and, and chemistry over the course of the season. And beyond that, uh, how much did that help in maybe, A, getting acclimatized to the American Hockey League, and B, with your success on the ice? Yeah, it was awesome to, be able to play with Drake. Obviously, really gifted player and somebody that I, you know, really enjoyed, you know, being around. And I think he helped me out a lot and, you know, gave me confidence and, um, you know, I think we had some similarities just, you know, it being my first year pro, obviously he went through that last year and had a lot of success. So I was able to, you know, learn from him and um, just be around him. And, you know, overall, he's just, you know, such an awesome guy. And, um, you know, I think that was definitely a credit to, you know, the year that I had. I, I really think that he helped me out a lot and, um, you know, just made me a better player. So, um, you know, Jake's a, a great guy. Josh, so uh, what do you consider your best weapon on the ice, uh, especially when you're really uh, at your best uh, on any given night? 
Um, I mean, I think I have, you know, a lot of different tools. I don't, I don't think I, you know, I just beat you one way. I think, um, you know, my skating is, is, a you know, at a high level and obviously was able to find the back of that, um, a good amount this year. And, you know, so I, I'd like to think I have, um, you know, like a, a high level shot and I think I can make guys better. And at the same time, I think I'm a 200 foot guy, obviously, um, like I said a moment ago, I was, you know, on the penalty kill for, um, you know, a few games there this year, which, you know, obviously I want to, you know, keep building off of and, um, you know, was able to be effective in the, the face-up circle, actually, which was a goal of mine, um, you know, once the season got rolling. So I think, you know, just my overall overall 200-foot game. What areas of your game do you want to shore up uh, before you're, you're uh, ready to make that full-time jump up to Ottawa? The main thing was, you know, I, was, I think – consistency i know i was able to you know be pretty consistent this year but um you know once you get to you know the next level that's that's the most important thing and being able to perform when you know maybe you don't feel your best um you know so obviously that's that's a huge goal of mine to to be able to bring that to the next level in ottawa how did you find the adjustment to a pro schedule uh playing you know the college schedule 37 games and then 17 last year and then you move up to a full you know three and three the whole the whole ahl experience yeah, I think you know, it was tough at times. Um, you know, obviously last year was a little bit different just because I was hurt and wasn't able to play as many games. I think, including World Juniors, I played 24 or 25 games. Um, and, you know, we, we played almost double that by the end of, you know, January, um, you know, or whatever it was. So it was um, it was a, a good amount of games, but I, I thought I adjusted well. And, um, you know, Jared Benoit, our strength guy, did a great job with me and, um, you know, just made sure that I was always ready to go. So, um, you know, as the season went along, I don't, I don't think that you know weighed weighed too much on me. Chatting with the AHL's outstanding rookie Josh Norris of the Belleville Senators, we mentioned making the jump to uh, pro from college. He played at the University of Michigan for the Wolverines. Couple questions on that. First off, what was it like going there, given the fact that your dad is an alumnus of Michigan State and uh, that whole rivalry? Yeah, I obviously get that question um, a lot. It was uh, it was awesome. I loved my time there. Um, I would recommend it to, to anyone that's considering going to school or the NCAA route. Um, but yeah, I had a you know a great time there. My first year, we had a really good team. Was able to you know go to the Frozen Four, and that was a great experience for myself. And um, you know, the second year, I was able to take another step and had a, a bigger role, and you know played a ton of minutes every night, which I think really helped me. And um, you know, I think just being able being able to grow up as a person was the biggest thing for me. Um, especially, you know, something that I noticed in my second year was just able to become more mature and um, just be a better person. So I think that's the most important thing. What do you miss most uh, about maybe the college uh, hockey experience and what's it like to play in a place like Michigan that's a pretty big-time hockey program in the NCAA? The biggest thing probably is just that there's there's always something to do, um, especially in a city like Ann Arbor. It's, um, you know, it's pretty high energy and pretty high strung and there's um, you know, a lot of good restaurants and um, you know social life, and obviously you still got the academic part of it. But um, yeah, there's always something to do, and it was great to be able to play at Michigan. We were you know sold out pretty much every night, um, no matter who we were playing. So obviously we had a really big following, and um, we really enjoyed playing at Yost. It's you know in my opinion the best rink in college hockey. Chatting with Josh Norris, uh, you were able to make your NHL debut this season as well. A couple of, of standout moments, I suppose, from that debut. First was the no bucket warm up lap, uh, the other was the uh, Bobby Ryan empty netter, which uh, made some headlines as well. How yeah. memorable was that night for you? Yeah, it was uh, obviously a special night, first NHL game, something that you never forget. And was uh, you know my parents were were able to fly in for that night, so it was great to you know have them there, and I actually. Spotted him in warm-ups. Um, I was actually sitting next to, to Drake on the blue line, and we were able to spot him in the corner. I didn't think I'd be able to see him just because there was a lot of people down there. But, um, yeah, it was obviously great to have them and um, just to, you know, enjoy that. Obviously, you know, worked a lot of years uh, to get to that point. So it's uh, a game I'll never forget. Speaking of uh, your parents, uh, your father obviously had a long pro career, uh, a lot of success uh, at different levels. Uh what what advice over over the years and maybe even more recently was he able to uh, offer you uh, on what you might expect, uh, especially in your first year of pro? Um, I mean, I think probably just that it's it's never like easy. Um, mm-hmm. There's so you know few few guys that end up making it, and there's 
there's not a huge difference between guys that end up making it and, and not making it. So I think just you know, try to be good at a lot of different things. Don't be one dimensional. Um, you know, be a good teammate, be able to play on the D side of the puck. Even if you are an offensive guy, I think that just makes you so much more valuable, um, you know, as a player, especially, you know, to a team. So um, I would just say, you know, being able to be multidimensional. Well, obviously with this pandemic uh, and the, the end of Ottawa season and Belleville season, uh, uh, how do you map out a uh, off-season training regimen here? It's uh, obviously a crucial year for you and your development, uh, but uh, in a lot of ways you don't know when you'll be playing again, and uh, it's difficult to get ice and difficult to, to, to get into a gym. How do you plan that? Uh, what are the challenges? Yeah, I don't really know, to be honest with you. I'm <laughs> kind of going through it, and I think a lot of kids are obviously in the same boat. Um, I have a, you know, a good plan in place for the next few months. And then obviously leading up to that or, or after that, um, is kind of up in the air and nobody really knows when the season's going to start. So, um, that'll be a little bit difficult maybe to, to plan and, you know, build around something just so that you don't get burned out. And, you know, at, obviously at the same time, making sure that you're well balanced and in good shape and, um, you know, getting enough ice and things like that. So it'll be, you know, difficult. Um, you know, down that stretch, but for right now, the next few months, I think uh, I got to get player in place. Do you treat right now as kind of a, a true off season? Uh, take a break. Uh, you mentioned you were playing golf today, um, and then try to ramp up closer to maybe the end of the summer when it comes to training and things like that. Like how how different do you think this off season is going to be, uh, given the way that things have have kind of played out over the last few months? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the first thing it stands was just the length of you know, the potential of, you know, the off season. Um, I think it, you know, if we start in December, it could be anywhere from six to seven months. Um, you know, obviously with us not having you know played since March, I guess that leaves almost 10 months with, with no games. So obviously that's difficult. Um, and yeah, for sure it'll be challenging. I think you don't want to, especially right now, you don't want to push it too hard. It was, you know, nice to get home and, um, for the first month kind of just, you know, take a break and get your mind off hockey. But, um, you know, I was able to get back to, you know, working out and, um, you know, gyms are opening up soon around here. So it'll be nice to get back in that atmosphere and, um, you know, kind of have a competitive mindset again and, um, yeah, just go from there. Uh, I did want to ask about, uh, you know, the circumstances that brought you to Ottawa. You were part of the Eric Carlson trade. Obviously, the fans have high expectations for anybody that comes back as a return for a player like that. Did you at all feel any pressure to live up to those expectations, and uh, do you still feel that way now that you've uh, had such a successful first pro year? No, I didn't feel like I needed to live up to any expectations. You know, Obviously, I think um, initially when the trade happened, I think, you know, rightfully so, the fans were um, a little bit down and maybe a little bit sour that, you know, obviously they traded one of the best defensemen in the, in the world. And, um, you know, obviously that's understandable, but at the same time, you know, not anything that I'm worrying about or anything that I can control. I just, you know, wanted to focus on myself and, um, you know, kind of just move forward. Obviously it was, it was a little bit, you know, I was caught off guard when the trade happened, but, um, I think ultimately it's worked out really well so far. And, um, I mean, yeah, I just want to keep building. That's, that's the only thing that I can control. And uh, we'll let you go on uh, one last question, just reflecting on your first pro season, winning the numerous awards that you did. What uh, is the one thing perhaps that you'll take from this first pro season moving forward? Maybe one thing that's going to stick with you? Um, I don't know. I think that's a good question. I think um, there's a lot of things, but um, I think maybe, you know, sitting on my patio right now, I think maybe just that I missed the game already and, um, you know, hope that, we were able to, you know, finish out the season and go on a playoff run. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I think it'll just help me be hungrier and uh, more excited to, to get back to hockey in the future. Yeah, we all missed the game and uh, can't wait till it's back. Can't wait to see you in action again. And uh, thanks for doing this, Josh. Really appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks, guys. No problem. So 23 of Around the A on the Sports Podcasting Network and wherever else you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in again with us. Uh, David Foote and Patrick Williams here. Big thanks to Josh Norris for squeezing in some time with us. I know he's been a busy guy and uh, we appreciate him taking some time to talk about his first pro season. And we again uh, send our congratulations out to him on his Rookie of the Year award. Uh, reminder, we're hoping to get 
the new MVP of the American Hockey League, Jerry Mayhew, on the show next week. So you'll want to stay tuned for that. Uh, I'd love to uh, hear his thoughts on uh, what we were talking about earlier, how tight the race may have been for MVP between him and his teammate Sam Annis. So uh, we'll look forward to that. Also looking forward to, in just a little bit, chatting with John Hoven, the uh, mayor of Ontario, if you will, Ontario, California, <laughs> uh, covers the uh, Ontario rain, uh, the LA Kings and all that for Sirius XM. So he'll be on with us in just a little bit to chat about the coaching change coming there with Mike Stuthers out, uh, not renewed in Ontario. But uh, lots of other stuff to touch on uh, before that, Pat. Let's start with perhaps what uh, uh, both of us were perhaps the most excited about at the end of last week as the uh, Henderson AHL franchise held their uh, extravaganza to uh, announce their new name, and we guessed it right here on Around the A. I should say you guessed it right. The Henderson Silver Knights, uh, now the real deal, and uh, we see the logo and the brand, and I got to say I am a fan. Yeah, um, I knew you were uh, definitely going to be uh, dialed into that uh, announcement. Uh, It used to be uh, fairly common in this league that you would get a lot of new teams coming in with new logos, jerseys, and all that. But now as the league has stabilized, a lot more of a rare situation. So to have this opportunity uh, with the Henderson Silver Knights was really cool. And uh, I think in typical Vegas uh, style, and certainly in uh, Vegas Golden Knights style, they did not uh, spare any... uh, uh, know effort in making it an event uh you know even in the uh middle of this pandemic with uh, hockey kind of being off to the side they made it a spectacle they had an hour-long show on their team website uh they broadcast on the local nbc affiliates uh i'm with you i love the logo i, I really am a big fan of logos that uh tie into the nhl club and the nhl team's identity but also have just enough of their own uh, flair uh, to kind of make it work on their own. And uh, some clubs do that uh, uh, around the league. Uh, Laval Rocket, a really good example of that. Uh, uh, San Diego Gauls, uh, for that matter, as well, out west. Uh, so it's, it's really cool to see what they've done with it. Uh, the other thing that was pretty neat was seeing them put the little diagram with that press release, uh, explaining all the different design decisions that, that went into it and and why they chose maybe one feature over another. They've definitely uh, arrived on the scene now. And uh, as we've uh, both said to each other, I think this can be a very popular destination for players around the league. Yeah, I, I was a little upset. I did like the Henderson blankety blanks that they were talking about uh, <laughs> uh, earlier on. They uh, even had some Henderson blankety blanks uh, apparel done up uh, just for the announcement. Uh, very Vegas to uh, go as in depth as you possibly can. The connection for me oh. is is the big thing. You mm-hmm. mentioned that that diagram, which I'm looking at right now, actually. But the ways that they kind of you know intertwined the two franchises. The Warhorse is kind of the big uh, symbol of the Silver Knights, and that was obviously an instrumental piece of a Knight's quest to become elite. They've just found so many ways to tie it back. The eyes on the horse logo are gold, which is a um, nod to the NHL club and a symbol of the Silver Knights always keeping their eye on the next level to become Golden Knights. Some people thought it was a little bit too on the nose, but I think they did a fantastic job with it. Absolutely, and and I would say anything's going to have its critics, but I'm not about to question the Vegas Golden Knights and their marketing, their abilities in that in that regard, because uh, everything they've done, really, part of the pun, is turned to gold the past three uh, years uh, since they came into the NHL and began play, so... I'm not. I'm not in any position to question the, either the name or the logo. I think the name just fits. It definitely lets you know that this is a Vegas Golden Knights top affiliate. And then the logo, uh, as you said, all the different symbols and design choices. Again, it, it conveys that connection to the Golden Knights, but also uh, has enough on its own that that it can stand by itself. In so many ways, uh, Bill Foley, the owner of the Golden Knights, uh, really is hands-on and really takes this stuff very seriously. And it's just really neat to see a market like Vegas and Henderson really get behind things early on. Uh, 7,600 season ticket deposits already. Uh, they're going to play in the Orleans Arena for two seasons, which in its own right is uh, a top-notch facility. Uh, opened up in uh, 2003. I think it seats about 8,000 people. Uh, most clubs would be thrilled to play in that uh, that arena permanently, but the Golden Knights are uh, on their way to building a new $84 million 
uh, arena in Henderson uh, that will open up in uh, 2022. And that's going to be a top-notch facility in itself, 6,000 seats. They compared it to the HEB Center in some ways, uh, which home of the Texas Stars, which having been there, I mean, that is a beautiful facility. So if they're even able to come anywhere close to that caliber. Uh, I think uh, Henderson and that club is are going to have a really nice facility for a long time. You mentioned the ownership and and how they feel about the AHL team. It was interesting to uh, hear Mr. Foley in his chat with uh, Darren Millard on that reveal show saying that they are going to care for their AHL team. He noted that some NHL clubs don't seem to care about their AHL affiliate, but they are going to put as much effort into that team and that franchise as they do the NHL club, and that's just going to be huge for the players and the staff there and for the Golden Knights organization as a whole to have that kind of dedication to both teams, understanding the importance that the AHL affiliate plays in the overall organization. Absolutely, and and he speaks with some credibility. Uh, uh, Back-to-back division titles for their current affiliate, or I should say their past affiliate, the Chicago Wolves, uh, they went to the Calder Cup final last year. Uh, really, the only thing stopping them last season was uh, the Charlotte Checkers, just a team that was on a mission. This season, they were again in the playoff uh, hunt. They had a very good chance to make it. If they had gotten in the playoffs, they could have done some damage again. So Vegas speaks with credibility on, on what it takes to build a real solid franchise. George McPhee, uh, now the current president of the Golden Knights, was heavily involved with the Hershey Bears uh, when they won three Calder Cups in the 2000s. He was general manager of the Washington Capitals. So he gets it, why it's important. And I think the other factor is uh, you're in the Las Vegas market. Yeah, you, ha- you have to stand out on your own. You cannot be a, a mediocre club. It's certainly something the Vegas Golden Knights at the NHL level embraced and, and really knew that they had to get the ground running. And I think the same thing we'll see uh, with the Henderson Silver Knights, that uh, they're going to come out, they'll put a really good team on the ice. They have a pretty good growing base of prospects to start with, and then you uh, sprinkle in uh, some good veterans, and I don't think they'll have any shortage of options of uh, young players that want to come there and be able to live in the same city, whether they're in the NHL or the AHL, play in a top-notch facility and play for a club that's uh, willing to spend money to win. You can see the pieces are already in place there that I think the Henderson Silver Knights could be a... uh, a real formidable uh, franchise, both on and off the ice in the AHL for a long time to come. And I think a lot of people will be looking towards them as uh, almost a role model for Seattle and what it decides to do with the Palm Springs franchise coming up next season. In typical Vegas fashion, they're all over the social media already. Uh, you can find the Silver Knights on Twitter at HS Knights, on Instagram at Silver Knights, and on Facebook, uh, Henderson Silver Knights, and the website, HendersonSilverKnights.com. To wrap it up, Outstanding reveal, fantastic look and feel. Can't wait to see what the jerseys look like moving forward. Let's move on to uh, the next topic of discussion, I suppose. We are going to get to the coaching change in Ontario in a moment, and then uh, eventually Pat will chat with John Hoven, analyst on Sirius XM and their NHL channel. But last week we issued a challenge to the fans, Pat, to uh, help us uh, play out what a potential Calder Cup playoff may have looked like if the AHL had followed the NHL's return to play format, we put out a poll on our Twitter at around the a pod and the results are in and uh, we're going to get set for round two here coming up. And I know you're working on a bracket as well, but what we did was for the top four seeds in each conference who will play around Robin to decide their playoff seeding. Uh, we just went by votes as to who fans thought would win that round robin or finish first and we can tell you that in the eastern conference the order was belleville providence hershey rochester belleville senators getting just over half of the votes cast in the west no change in what the seeds were milwaukee iowa tucson colorado and the admirals a whopping 91 percent of the votes cast to uh, solidify their place atop that west round robin group the rest of the way down in the East, we had Utica beating Wilkes-Barre with 69.4% of the vote. Charlotte beating Springfield with 81.4% of the vote. Hartford getting by Laval with 67.2%. And the only upset on the East was number 9 Syracuse beating number 8 Binghamton with 65 or so percent of the vote. Uh, on the West, Stockton beating San Antonio, 69% there. San Diego gets by Texas, 57%. The only upset in the West was Rockford over Ontario. That's a number 10 
over a number seven with 53.9%, and then Grand Rapids uh, getting by Chicago with 57% of the vote. So it sets up some interesting matchups moving forward for us. Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, the Devil Senators uh, apparently earned a lot of respect from the HL fans uh, who participated in the vote. Uh, first off, thanks to all the fans who uh, gave their feedback. It was really interesting to see how these uh, results turned out. I think some of the pitches went uh, as you'd expect on, on ice. Uh, others, I was a little surprised to see where fans thought each team landed, but, uh, you know, matchups uh, are what the playoffs are all about. And now that we have all of our round-robin play done and our and our uh, mini-series done, uh, now they uh, set up really a first-round matchup there. So uh, some really intriguing what-if uh, circumstances going into the next round of polling. And we'll have those polls live for you at Around the A-Pod on Twitter so you can cast your vote, and we'll uh, fill you in on how those go next week as well as we uh, you know try to get some playoff hockey in uh, despite the season ending uh, unceremoniously early due to COVID-19. Let's move on to the final big headline I think of the week Pat a coaching change in Ontario. Uh, Mike Stuthers is out after six years at the helm. Obviously the rain looking to make a bit of a change here moving forward. Yeah uh, the Los Angeles Kings uh, obviously are in a full rebuild mode I was a little surprised. I think Mike Stuthers was a little surprised as well based on uh, hearing some of his uh, talk with the media lately. Six seasons in the American League uh, with one club uh, is a long time. He had a ton of success there. Coach of the year in his first season there, 2014-15, when they were still actually with the Manchester Monarchs. Uh, The following year, they moved west. And uh, as defending Calder Cup champions, they make another return trip to the Western Conference Final. So uh, over the years... uh, he was just a, a real successful coach, both both in terms of development, but also winning and having uh, some really good clubs there early on. They had a few lean years in between, but had bounced back really nicely uh, this season before play was stopped. So Mike Stoddard is one of the real characters in this league. A real throwback, uh, and yet he's able to relate well to players. Uh, I thought it was very notable how many players, uh, both current and former, really expressed appreciation for him and, and just their, their respect Captain Brett Sutter, uh, the longtime captain there in Ontario, uh, had some really nice words for Stuthers on social media, and you saw just a lot of that affection uh, for their coach, which is not always the case in this league. Sometimes players and young prospects uh, do not want to, they do not want to hear what their coach has to say, but a guy like Stuthers, he was a real hard-nosed defenseman back when he uh, played in the, the American League, back in the 80s and 90s, when <laughs> It was kind of a wild and woolly place. You know, he brought that right into coaching, and uh, he's had success at multiple different levels, uh, both in junior and the NHL as well as the American League. So he's a he's a guy that a lot of ways young at heart and has adjusted well, but I think uh, L.A. decided that it was time for just a fresh perspective. That's going to be a very highly sought-after job uh, for a lot of coaches. Uh, they practice in the L.A. Kings uh, training facility. They have... A real top-notch facility there uh, for their regular home arena. And it's a real plum job. So I think uh, whoever the Ontario Reign slash LA Kings eventually uh, settle on uh, will be a really uh, a good fit. And you know, I think Stuthers, for his end of things, will be uh, a guy that will find uh, work very soon as well. Yeah, and who knows what the hiring process looks like for the Ontario Reign and the LA Kings moving through this offseason. Uh, I guess they don't have to rush to make a hire, but as interesting as it's going to be for players to find homes and for player signings to get done during this extended offseason, I think finding new coaches and hiring staff is going to be difficult for some teams as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, in every aspect, really, of hockey, whether you're talking about players and their training or, or teams and free agency or coaches, coaching decisions nobody has a real timeline to work with even the nhl return to play initiative is uh, still very much i think written in pencil and it's tentative and there's still a lot of details to be worked out with that if that even actually eventually does come to fruition let alone an off season and free agency and trying to plan for next season whenever that is i think it's probably an advantage for any nhl clubs in that hiring decision, uh, that they do have time, they, they're they able to uh, evaluate every candidate pretty extensively, even beyond what they already do. But I think uh, for coaches, it's a little bit certainly nerve-wracking now because the timelines are going to be stretched out quite a bit, and that's just a lot of time uh, if you're, you're trying to nail down another job. 
you're going to be sitting by the phone and uh, waiting for waiting to hear from somebody. Poaching is a, a tough business. Uh, if the NHL jobs, all 31 right now, soon, soon to be 32, are the top jobs in hockey, then these uh, American League jobs are right behind them. They're hard to come by and uh, they're hard to get. And when an opportunity comes uh, like this, I think you can expect there literally hundreds of resumes will come in. Well, lots of questions about who uh, may replace uh, Mike Stuthers, who's out again after six years as the head coach of the Ontario Reign, the AHL affiliate of the LA Kings. Maybe we'll get some answers as to uh, who could replace him and what's next for that club. Pat's going to speak next with John Hoven, runs the Mayor's Manor blog. John uh, is affectionately known as the Mayor of Ontario, and uh, he's going to join us next uh, on Around the A to talk a bit more about the Ontario Reign. I wanted to get your thoughts here. It was obviously a, a very surprising move uh, in a lot of circles. Uh, the news that Mike Stuthers, after six seasons with the LA system, is is out. Give us a little of your insight on on what happened. What was the thinking behind it, and uh, what's next for Mike Stuthers, who's uh, one of the real character coaches in this league? Yeah, a lot to unpack there, Pat. Uh, I, I would say first off, what's next for him is sort of to be determined. I think that when you look to uh, two. Two other teams that will be here in the Pacific Division going forward in Palm Springs, which will be the Seattle franchise, and then in, in Las Vegas, which will be the uh, the new franchise for the Golden Knights. You know, from a personal standpoint, that's where I'd love to see him land. I think it would be great because then we have the opportunity to interact with them, uh, you know, on, on a continuous basis. Uh, just like you said, a great coach, a great man, uh, loved by his players, loved by everybody really in the organization. Uh, but if, if you look at the Las Vegas situation, it, it, it takes a special sort of type of coach and a, and a coach that has discipline to be able to corral young players. And you hear junior coaches talk about this, which obviously Stutz had experience at the junior level and, and had success there in Owen Sound as well. Junior coaches talk about it. American League coaches talk about it. Young players, keeping them on the straight and narrow uh, with curfews and sort of different things. And you think about Las Vegas, and it's one thing to put a pro team in there and at the NHL level, but now for them to be able to have their American League team you know, 18, 19, 20-year-old kids with access to all of the, the fun stuff that can happen in Vegas sounds like a scary proposition. And they'll be close to the Strip for the next couple of years until they move out into Henderson, which, uh, for those that don't know, the, the lay of the land is probably about 30 to 45 minutes away, mm. more in the suburbs. So until their new building is built and, and they have access to that, you know, uh, Strip life, if you will, <laughs> I, personally, I think it'd be a great fit for Stuthers to, to go in there and uh, be able to control those young players and, and, and that would be fantastic for uh, for the Vegas organization. We'll have to see where this all shakes out, though. Um, I'm, I'm sure his phone's been ringing off the hook here over the last couple of days. To go to some of the earlier questions there, uh, you know, what happened? Look, here's the weird thing about the entire situation. Everybody inside the Kings organization, and I would say over the weekend I spoke to, I, I, would, I would say everybody in the organization uh, at one point or another in about a 24 to 48 hour window regarding Mike Stuthers. There's nothing but phrase from top to bottom uh, throughout the management circles, coaching staff, scouts, uh, you know, players, you name it. Everybody loves this guy. Uh, it just seems that the team had decided that they wanted to go into a different direction. And, you know, the elephant in the room that uh, doesn't really seem to get addressed, but but there's some truth to it and, and there's, you know, reality to it. He was a Mike Fuda guy. So when the organization decided to move on from Mike Fuda, uh, which is a whole other conversation, uh, it, it probably in many ways sealed the fate for, for Mike Stuthers, and that, that has nothing to do with what he's capable of and, and what he accomplished. Uh, great success in, in not only winning the Calder Cup, the final season in Manchester, but also in developing and getting ready many players that you wouldn't consider to be quote-unquote top prospects, but he's turned into fine NHL players, guys like Sean Walker, mm -hmm. Matt Roy, and uh, you know even uh, some of the guys that are still on their way coming up, Jared Anderson Dolan, Matt Luff, you know, Carl Grundstrom and so on. So a great track record for a guy like Mike Stuthers and just a, just a wonderful human being. And uh, players were coming out of the woodwork contacting me after the news broke, talking about how much they love and respect him and, and how he's their favorite coach of all time, which I think really says a lot about him, not only as a coach, but also just as a person. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the way he treats his players and obviously a very popular coach with his players. It's always been my impression, all my dealings with him, that's, he walks that very fine line between 
Um, he can be an authoritarian type of coach. He could also be your uh, best friend, give you a pat on the back. And uh, kind of could be the same, you know, maybe within a you know, five or 10 minute span. Um, is, is that is that a correct impression uh, that, that uh, he is able, he treats his players like men. Uh, he does give them some leeway, but he also knows when to pull the reins in. Yeah, I think the word that, that we should use a lot here is accountability. Mm-hmm. He's not afraid to hold people accountable, but understand that with accountability comes motivation as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that when they do things right, when they do things the correct way and when they need encouragement and when they need motivation that comes with it as, as much as the tough love part of the accountability when you're doing something wrong you need to be called out for it and um you know you, you need to be corrected uh over the weekend when we when we did our, our latest uh, kings of the podcast mm-hmm. which is our show here in los angeles one of the things that i said was i take great exception to people from the outside that want to take pot shots at the guy or that don't understand who he is and want to want to categorize or classify him in with that, that old dinosaur group, uh, you know, guys like Daryl Sutter, who were all about accountability and toughness. And, and that's taking nothing away from Daryl. Obviously, you know, he's a two-time Stanley Cup champion coach and, and, and has a, a very successful resume. But the guys like Daryl Sutter, uh, guys like John Tortorella, and then the list goes on and on. They're, they're cut from a different cloth. Yeah. Uh, I, I liken Mike Stuthers to more of like a Todd McClellan, mm-hmm. somebody who understands how to hold people accountable, but does it with a lot of dignity and a lot of respect. And I keep coming back to the same thing. Why is it that so many players who are no longer in the organization will tell you that Mike Stuthers is their favorite coach of all time? He's the type of guy that they want to play with and how much love and respect they have for him. If he, if he was somebody who was demeaning or somebody who, uh, you know, was all to the left of the accountability scale, right? And didn't mm-hmm. have that motivation and encouraging and, you know, treating people with dignity and respect. People wouldn't have those feelings about him. I, I always sort of, when, when somebody who's playing for a curtain coach and they talk up that coach at that time, I take it somewhat with a grain of salt. I'm sure there's some sincerity to it. Mm-hmm. At the same time, that's the guy that you're playing for. And yeah. So you're kind of playing a mind game to get more minutes and all that sort of stuff, right? Sure. There's, there's reasons that you might praise your current coach. But when you've been gone for two or three, four or five years, when you're in a completely different organization and you have nothing to gain, uh, from those kind of comments, then that's about as sincere as you can possibly get. And people are saying it publicly. People are saying it privately. Uh, and again, I can't even begin to tell you uh, how many people were calling me on Saturday after the news broke to talk about Mike Stuthers. They wanted to know what was going on. They wanted to, you know, uh, make sure that they complimented him and praised him. And uh, I, a funny story that I shared uh, uh, on, on our podcast was just that Stuthers called me a couple hours after the news broke. And uh, he got my voicemail, which was full. So he sends me a text message and says, hey, dude, you know, tried to call you, uh, but your voicemail was full. And I had to reply to him and tell him, yeah, it's full because everybody's calling me to talk about you. So <laughs> it was, uh, it was kind, of, kind of a funny moment uh, yeah. on, on Saturday afternoon. But I eventually was able to connect with them and uh, just, a, just a great conversation and, and, and a great mm-hmm. guy. And can't wait to see where he, he lands next because I have a tremendous amount of respect for Mike Stutters. You know, those of us who deal with him uh, outside media, um, you know, we may deal with him a few times a season, but uh, you obviously, you know, they call you the mayor for a reason, uh, obviously very uh, uh, tight and very uh, frequent relationship with, with Mike Stuthers. W- what's he like to deal with uh, on a day-to-day type of basis uh, after a big win or a, a tough loss or just uh, even uh, on a practice day? You know, it's a great question because I always laugh that, that Stutz uh, loves to throw curveballs at you. So he, mm-hmm. he's typically the, the opposite uh, or, or at least something different than what you would expect. And uh, my story there is that the team will come in off a big win, you know, a 6-1 victory or something. And, you know, they really dominated the game and took it to the other team. And you expect Stutz to be in a good mood. Mm-hmm. And then you'll, you'll go in to talk to him and he'll give you one-word answers. And he's really short. <laughs> And, and later you'll end up finding out, you know, that even though they won, he's really disappointed with, uh, certain aspects of the system that broke down or, or things like that. So, um, I always find that kind of funny. And, and, and the opposite of that is true as well. So the, the team will get it handed to them. And, and they certainly did early in the season. It was a really young team this year. Mm-hmm. So they had their struggles the first, first couple months of the season. And they would have a really bad night and they'd be blown out and they'd be down by, you know, a handful of goals in the first period. And you would expect him to be in a really surly mood after the game, and and he'd be kind of all smiles, and he'd be he'd be doing just fine. And uh, when I asked him about that recently, he just you know commented to the fact of look that when a team you know gets blown out like that, the last thing you sort of need to do is rub their nose in it. They know mm-hmm. what they did wrong. They know that things were bad, 
and you're not going to help the situation by, you know, adding to it. So he tries to sort of mix it up a little bit and, uh, you know, just get back at it and practice the next day or maybe give the team the day off the next day and then get back at it afterward. And it started to make a little bit more sense, the message of the madness there. But uh, I, I do always sort of chuckle when, when things from the outside appear to be going really well. Mm. And um, he's, he's just not in the mood to talk about it that night. <laughs> now, is that him uh, just, uh, you know, because I've dealt with coaches like that. Sometimes you wonder, is it, are they just messing with you, uh, you know, just trying to be difficult? Or is it really come down that they saw some stuff in their game that they didn't like, uh, even though it was a win? Um what would Stuthers be like in that kind of situation? I, I really believe it's more of the latter. Mm-hmm. Um, look, he loved to mess with, with me. He loved to mess with anybody in the media, yeah. uh, you know, but that's just part of what makes him so, so much fun to be around. Uh-huh. Right. He's uh, he'll, he'll give it, he'll give it to you. Uh, but he'll also let you know if, you know, uh, there, there were times where maybe I didn't see him for a while because I was covering the Kings or doing something different and, or maybe they had a road trip or whatnot. And, you know, when you come back, Regardless of what the score is, when when he sees you for the first time in a while, he he greets you with, I won't say with open arms. Uh, I I joke that he's not much of a hugger, and that's uh-huh. okay. But um, he you know verbally he greets you with open arms, and he, and and you know he wants to find out where you've been, how you've been, what's going on, wants to check on you, wants to make sure that you're okay. Uh, you know those those sorts of things. Uh, so very personable that way. Um, and he, he he's not uh, he's not. Daryl Sutter, I just keep mm-hmm. coming back to Daryl. Daryl's the kind of guy that'll mess with you. Daryl's the kind of guy yeah. that would, uh, in those press conferences that the fans love and the media hated, <laughs> for the most yes. part, uh, D- Daryl Daryl's playing mind games with you, and he, he's trying to keep you off your toes, and he's trying to say things to to disrupt and cause chaos, uh, you know, <laughs> and 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 almost being rude and snarky about it. Yeah, and, and that's not Stuthers. Stuth- Stuthers was. Um, I can't recall. Maybe there was a time in, in his in his six years uh, with the Kings organization, but I certainly can't recall a time where I felt that he was um, rude or or you know disingenuous in any way whatsoever. That, that you know when he was when he was upset, when he was surly, uh, he tried to measure his comments and be short. And he usually, almost always, I would say, would would end up explaining those comments. So if he if he felt that he didn't give you the answers that you were looking for that day, the next time you saw him. He would build on it. He would he would refer back to it, and he would then sort of explain more of where he was coming from. And um, the thing that I always I, I would say come back to with, with Stutz that I truly appreciate is he would give you the time of day whenever you needed it. He understood that you had a job to do, and mm-hmm. you were there to get answers and information. Um, but that he was open to questions. There, there really there wasn't a time where he didn't uh, you know big picture. Maybe in the heat of the moment he didn't he didn't want to answer a question, but but big picture, uh, he, he was open to whatever question. If you wanted mm-hmm. to dive into something very specific about, you know, the power play or the use of who was playing left wing and why, I mean, he, he would he would explain and teach and, and help the media as much as he would have, uh, you know, helped and taught, you know, a player uh, or somebody else like that. So he, he was always very accessible in, in, in that sense, um, which I think, you know, we, we can all appreciate. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that uh... – there's that stereotype, uh, he's a dinosaur, uh, that just kind of gets thrown around by people that aren't really actually familiar with him. Uh, but we're all kind of uh, creatures of habit in some way, uh, shape or form. How, you know, for a guy who is as old school as it gets in a lot of ways, how was he able to adapt to this new type of player that we hear about so much? Uh, the, the young 19, 20 year old kids that, that really are uh, in some ways very different, uh, even from maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Well, you know, I think it goes back to his roots of he was, he was a coach in junior. So mm-hmm. he's used to being around the younger players. Um, this isn't just a guy who's an NFL, uh, excuse me, NHL. Maybe yeah. he was in the NFL. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's not an NHL lifer yeah. uh, where he's been around, you know, men as players. He, yeah. He's been around the younger generation, and you look at the success that he had uh, in Owen Sound, and you look at the the guys that he had, the guys that ended up becoming NHL players, whether you're talking about, you know, Bobby Ryan or, or Sakara. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's so mm-hmm. many of them. He He's used to having those players that he's having to mold into being young men, and I think that that, that plays well in the American League. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I was actually very surprised uh, at, at the timing of him Leaving, and I understand that the Kings organization wants to go in more of a, mm-hmm. a, a developmental type path. That's that's the phrasing that they keep using. Um, but when I think about the the deep prospect pool of the LA Kings, 
and what those guys need. Turcotte needs to be made into a man. Mm-hmm. Madden, uh, Akil Thomas, you just, you know, you go on down the line. Um, he's the type of guy who, as we talked about earlier, has that soft hand where he can show you love and, and respect and then has that, that accountability. Uh, and I think that's just probably why he's been able to connect with so many young players, whether you're talking about his time in Manchester and that Calder Cup team, uh, whether you're talking about his, you know, previous experience at other stops along the way. Um, he's, he's, he's dealt with, young players for the majority, if not all of his coaching career. So he's used to, you know, guys that are at that pivotal moment in their life as, as human beings, right. Yeah. As they're, as they're growing up and becoming men. Um, so this is really nothing new. And, and he has a supporting cast as well. Let's not, let's not forget that you have the video coaches, you have the assistant coaches who help you as well. And, and, and as a, as a coach, you're a lifelong learner. You're, you're adapting and you're changing as much as you're, teaching as well because you're seeing when you're pushing certain buttons with players you're seeing what's working and what's not working and and you have to adapt in order to be able to get through to those players and 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 again i think that's why he's continued to have success uh, as recently as you know names like sean walker and Mm -hmm. matt roy and some of those guys that i mentioned earlier that are now you know fine nhl players uh, in part because of the tutelage that they were provided by by studs you mentioned that there's there's this change this uh, increased emphasis on development and i guess and I've heard that that thrown around quite a bit. I, I guess my first question is that is um, as opposed to to what I mean, because I I mean the, uh, this league is, is geared first and foremost toward player development. I'm thinking how much more development oriented can they get? Uh, am I missing something here? Well, I think it's a great question. It's one that's yet to sort of fully been explained to me or that's yet to fully be on display just because the training center hasn't opened. But mm-hmm. what I can tell you is this, is that from a, from a practice standpoint, from a, let's use that as, as, a, as a pseudo for uh, you know, development, uh, from a practice standpoint, the rain were on the ice with, with Stutz and his coaching staff a couple days a week, and they had one day that was earmarked as development. So the Kings mm-hmm. have a lot of what I would consider specialty coaches at the development level, guys like Mike Donnelly, Sean O'Donnell, Craig Johnson, Jared Stoll, et cetera. A lot of former, obviously, NHL players to get in there and, and work with guys on individual sport or either specific player uh, skills or specific position skills. So sometimes it'll be three or four young defensemen and they'll work with Sean O'Donnell. Sometimes it'll be one-on-one where a guy would work with someone like Craig Johnson on skating or, what, or whatnot. Um, so from, from a development standpoint, at least in my mind, um, what I'm uh, e- expecting to see would be more of those specialized uh, sort of sessions with the players and less of an emphasis maybe on systems and, 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 and traditional type practices. Mm-hmm. I guess we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how that, how that plays out uh, because obviously you do need some of the systems you know, uh, practice because you're getting guys ready for that system that Todd McClellan mm-hmm. is playing. And so um, I, I'm also not sure, you know, you didn't ask this question, but I'll say I'm also not sure of the relationship between McClellan and, and Stutz. It was, mm-hmm. it was always expressed to me from both men um, that it was, it, it was cordial and they were forming a relationship. And I remember asking McClellan about it at one point mid season. And he was like, Hey, look, you know, we go to coffee, we get together for coffee a couple times a week. You know, we try to have, really have our sit down meetings. So they were working on developing their own relationship. And um, given that, that, that Stutz fully understands that the American League is, is not all about winning the Calder Cup, it's really about getting guys ready. And he talked about that throughout his tenure that it was about, at the beginning of the year, understanding hey, look, these three or four players need to get them ready by February so that they're available to be called up or that they're available to maybe be used in a trade or something like that. So, he understood the role of the American League, and I'd like to believe that he was, you know, on the same page from a, a development and system standpoint, you know, with a guy like Todd McClellan. So, uh, back to your question, I, I'm very interested to see what this new, heavier emphasis on development means um, once things get back up and running again. Does that run the risk of having uh, kind of too many chefs in the in the kitchen, where you have a guy for this, a guy for that, uh, and all of a sudden, before you know it, you have five, six, seven people all kind of you know, player's ear uh, on one aspect of his game or another, and uh, kind of it all gets – the message maybe loses some of its consistency? It's possible. I mean, it certainly is possible. I I would say that um, I think that that risk exists within the world of hockey right now anyway because Mm -hmm. you look at all of these guys, and even at the junior level, you know, they, they, they they have their whole network of, you know, 
uh, trainers and nutritionists and, mm-hmm. and all these, you know, skating coach, you know, a shooting coach and all this. So I think it's just prevalent uh, throughout the world of hockey. I don't think it's just unique to the LA Kings right now. Uh, but at the same time, one of the things that I think a guy like Todd McClellan really brings to the organization that's, that was missing for so many years and it's so fundamental in my mind to success long term is communication. Todd is a great communicator. So uh, while I don't know this as a fact, I, I've never asked the question, maybe I need to, um, I would assume that Todd is having organizational meetings with the development staff and that they're communicating to make sure that they're all on the same page. Um, so the guys like Jared Stoll and Craig Johnson and, and Donnelly and all those names that I mentioned, um, that they, they end up being an, an extension or an, uh, you know, an arm of uh, Todd McClellan's coaching staff in, in many ways. Um, that's what made this organization successful back in, in, in 2012 and mm-hmm. 2014. And in that era, uh, Dean Lombardi, uh, you know, led with a very clear direction uh, where, you know, you're either with us or against us and everybody was on, on the same page and, and, and aiming towards the same goal, not just in the terms of the Stanley Cup, but in the way that they wanted the organization to run with the culture and, and, and the development of players. And um, while some of that sort of had gotten away from a couple of years, I think that under the direction of Rob Blake and, and, and Nelson Emerson and that group there, they're working and getting back in that direction. And that's why the hiring of Todd McClellan, uh, to me, w- w- was so instrumental towards any future success that the Kings are going to have. It, it, it's really going to be led by, by Todd McClellan, not only behind the bench at the NHL level, but uh, utilizing his communication skills to uh, align people at the American League level as well. Traditionally speaking, over I guess the past six seasons and and perhaps even going forward, how much have uh, has Stuthers and just the the rain in general had to rely on you know captain their captains Brett Sutter, uh, Vince Laverde before the, before that uh, to really uh, kind of lead the charge here? You know, di- different clubs around the league sometimes the captain is a little bit more of a figurehead. Other t- times it's much more of an assertive personality. Uh, what has that uh, dynamic been like uh, in the Ontario system the past few years? Well, the captain at the American League level, especially when you're trying to develop prospects uh, like the Kings have been or, and will be going forward, mm-hmm. so it, he's so instrumental. He's that bridge, right? So yeah. he's the bridge between the coach and what they're trying to do, and he's, he's at least you know mathematically uh, typically closer in age to the, to the players and mm-hmm. someone that they can relate to, even though that he's somebody that they look up to. The Kings have been very fortunate, the Reign more specifically, have been very fortunate um, with two great men, two great mm-hmm. leaders uh, in that, from that standpoint. You know, guys that lead from the front uh, in Vinny Laverde uh, and, and in uh, uh, Sutter. So it, it's, uh, I, I think if there's any sort of a rub there, it's just maybe been the fact that, that, that Sutter, uh, Stutz maybe relied on Sutter too much from an offensive standpoint. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that he, he might take exception to that because if you look at the, the team that he had last year and just how young they were, it's really difficult and, and truly a man's league. I mean, the American League is, is such a step up from from junior. I, I think the gap from junior to the American League is so much bigger than the gap from the AHL to the NHL. Yeah. Uh, so, so truly playing in a man's league, I mean, how, you know, how many minutes can you really give a kid like Jared Anderson Dolan as a first-year mm-hmm. rookie? Uh, and, and, and Kapari as well, you know, a kid coming over from Europe. I mean, these are really young immature, not, not from a personality standpoint, but in terms of their, their physical development, you know, and their mental development as they're, as they're moving into becoming men. So you have to rely on a guy like uh, Sutter to, to be able to carry the load, not only in, in taking important face-offs and, you know, the defensive responsibilities or, or even being the guy who's driving the bus from an offensive standpoint. So the rain really um, took a step forward on the ice this year when, when Velarde uh, was back and he was healthy and, and, and it gave them more options uh, besides just Brett Sutter. And, and obviously v- Velarde's uh, a younger player as well, but um, just somebody who, given his skills, he's so much more dynamic and able to adapt and adjust uh, to the American League. I mean, you're talking about a kid who who really in about a six-week period, you know, became a full-fledged pro player, you know, where, where most guys, it takes them about a half a season to a full season in the American League to really get it. Uh, Velarde was there in, in probably about six weeks. So I'm sure that Stutz appreciated that. But uh, Sutter, uh, you know, back to the question, uh, just like a Vinny Laverde, cuts mm-hmm. in the same cloth, somebody who works very well with the coaching staff uh, and, and is a great bridge to bring the message uh, to the younger players and, and then lead from the front and, and be a true example to the kids that are trying to figure out how to become professionals. One last question uh, for the going forward. Uh, what do you see uh, the Kings in terms of candidates 
what will they be looking for? What type of coach will they want? And uh, are there any potential names that you uh, you might uh, uh, serve up as a uh, as a possible strong option for them? I, I think that right now, as we sit here today, just a few days removed from from Stutz leaving, I think there are three names uh, that I have on the short list. Uh, one would be Chris Height. He's mm-hmm. the assistant, or was the assistant coach. Um, he he left the organization for for a couple years and then returned. Uh, back under Stutz, um, has a good relationship with the players and would, would provide for an easy transition. Uh, and, and especially if, if, the, if the focus going forward is going to be more on the development side of things, um, you, you can implement the development side through the development coaches that we talked about earlier. And then uh, there's a lot of sort of seamless transition into the, the, the systems and whatnot based upon what they were doing last year because Height was already here. Mm. Uh, the second name would be Mike, uh, excuse me, I was going to say Mike Feathers. Uh, obviously, he's not a candidate. The, um, the second name would be Marco Sturm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I believe that, that Marco Sturm was sort of a, a square peg in a round hole last year um, under, under Todd McClellan. That's not a knock at Marco. It's just to I mean, I don't think that when Todd McClellan took the job in Los Angeles that he was expecting Marco to be his assistant coach, uh, you know, he brought in uh, Trent Yanni, and I think that he was expecting, I know he was expecting to bring in somebody else. There was a lot of discussion about how to get Woodcroft uh, out of out of Baco and um, that sort of thing. So mm-hmm. maybe there were a couple of other names that were in that mix as well. So I just don't think that um, Marco was probably on the, the first or second choice of what Todd had expected. He's never told me that. This is more of a gut feel. But from what I do understand in talking to people recently, um, they had started to form a, a relationship, if you will. Todd was understanding how to use Marco, how to how to tap into his skills as an assistant coach. And and the word is that really over the last couple of months of the season, uh, regular season here, that, that they had started to find their groove. Mm-hmm. Is that enough to keep him behind the bench in Los Angeles next year? I don't know. Um, I do know that the organization thinks fairly, very highly of Marco Sturm, and they'd like to see him develop, uh, you know, his coaching resume if you will so perhaps there's a way for uh moving him to the american league he becomes the coach of ontario uh you know after spending a year under todd he would certainly bring a lot of those systems and that methodology that mcclellan's trying to put put into the organization he could carry that through to the american league level and then you'd have to go out and find another assistant coach so that leads me to the third name uh which would be jim montgomery Mm -hmm. um you you could slide him in either as an assistant coach at the NHL level, or you could put him as the head coach in Ontario, depending how you wanted to to move your you know your chairs around on the deck. Uh, the reason that, that I serve up Montgomery as a name to keep an eye on is the Kings did try to hire him. They they recruited him and, and were rather aggressive in wanting to get him uh, as a, an assistant coach right after Rob Blake took over in 2017. They tried to hire him as an assistant coach under John Stevens. And uh, at the time, Montgomery just really wasn't willing to leave, understandably so, Denver, to become an assistant NHL coach. He had a great gig in Denver, you know, uh, national champion, you know, toast of the town, um, and and had a, a great situation there uh, in Colorado and wasn't willing to leave unless he was going to be the head coach and have full control, which obviously Dallas ended up giving him, you know, down the road. So they did try to hire him. Uh, there was a lot of interest there. I wouldn't be surprised if they circled back. And at the same time, Todd McClellan, um, knows him pretty well because Todd's son uh, was at Denver and was coached mm-hmm. by by Montgomery. So the last thing I would just say about Montgomery is, look, this is a guy who obviously had a very public, you know, sort of uh, personal issue, and and this is an opportunity for him would be an opportunity for him to to come back into the world of hockey. I'm sure that he's, you know, um, going to have to take make some concessions. So this might be a time where uh, sort of a perfect storm, right? The Kings would be able to get credit for giving a guy a second chance. They'd be able to get him on the cheap uh, because he, Montgomery certainly can't dictate what terms he would come back into the hockey world, you know, uh, as uh, from, a, from a contract standpoint. So it could end up really being a win-win for all parties involved. Uh, the question for me would just be, you know, where do you put him? Are you are you better off putting him under the, the close watchful eye of Todd McClellan on an NHL bench? Or um, do you think that he'd be okay, uh, you know, as an American League head coach coming back in? So. Haven't heard that name from anybody else. Just, just me, sort of uh, piecing together past conversations with different people in the organization. But those would be the three names at the moment, and um, we'll have to see how the list widens as we uh, move along here in the summer. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us, and uh, uh, it's a very interesting situation what's happened there, and I think uh, a lot more still to come. Uh, so, uh, 
thank you again for, for coming on with us. Appreciate it, Pat, and I uh, love your coverage of the American League. Look forward to reading more of it as we go ahead. down episode 23 of Around the A on the Sports Podcasting Network. Thanks to uh, John Hoban for his time and getting us a bit more detail on the Ontario Reign and what's happening there. Uh, you can find John on Twitter as well at Mayor NHL. And uh, of course, thanks to Josh Norris for his time earlier on as well. The uh, reigning AHL outstanding rookie at Josh Norris 10. If you want to follow along with Josh on social media Big things ahead for that kid, without a doubt. Also want to remind you that our playoff polls will be live this week with round number two of our What If the AHL Followed the NHL's Return to Play format. Share that around. Uh, The more votes, uh, the better. We'd love to hear what the fans uh, have to say about the potential playoff matchups that could have happened if the AHL had followed the same route. Uh, it would be interesting to see what uh, everybody has to say. And and speaking of input, we'd love to hear from you either via review on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, please uh, subscribe and rate and review the podcast. Or if you have feedback, guest suggestions, things like that, you can email us around the apod at gmail.com. Uh, we would love to uh, hear from the fans moving forward. Another good show here, Pat. Lots uh, that we went over and uh, a couple of good interviews as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Josh Norris, like we said, a really exciting young rookie. Uh, a lot of good insight what goes through a rookie's head. Uh, it was nice that he was pretty forthcoming uh, with us. And it's always an interesting experience for young rookies that have had nothing but success at, at every previous level. And sometimes the AHL is where they really first hit their first stretch of adversity. The pro schedule can be brutal on young players. The adjustment is uh, significant. Uh, they'll all tell you that. A lot of them will even tell you it's uh, a bigger jump going to the AHL from college or junior than it is from the AHL to the NHL simply because it's just that much more intense and you're playing against guys that in a lot of cases uh, there, are, there are NHL veterans that are playing down in this league. Young players like Josh Norris, they have their work cut out for him. And yet, uh, to his credit, he came right in and just, in a lot of ways, was dominant throughout the season. So uh, a lot of great insight from him and uh, really excited to have him in. And John Hoven, real character. You know, he, he has a name mayor for a reason because uh, he's that kind of personable guy. He seems to know everybody. You know, been dialed into the LA Kings uh, in the Ontario ring for a long, long time and uh, has done a lot of really cool things around the hockey world. He had a great relationship with Mike Stuthers there, uh, so a lot of great insight from him as well. And just as far as our uh, fan poll went, any surprises for you in the matchups that the fans chose winners for? For me, the only one that maybe I think could have gone the other way would have been Binghamton potentially beating Syracuse uh, if they had actually played a mini series because the Devils were just red hot through the end of the season. But uh, anything surprise you, or did the fans get it right in your opinion? Yeah, I'm with you on the uh, on the Binghamton Devils. Uh, they were nine and one down the stretch. They were on a seven and zero streak when play was stopped back in March. Syracuse, uh, they had some struggles this year, but that Binghamton team was just rolling. So uh, yeah, that that surprised me a little bit. Uh, and we had discussed off the air the, the Chicago Grand Rapids matchup. A little bit of a surprise. I think that was a toss up matchup, but uh, the fans. They had their say. So uh, overall, pretty good pitches, I thought, across the league uh, that matched up pretty well. The Belleville Senators uh, were able to vault the Providence Bruins and take uh, that first spot. But it was an interesting playoff field to start with, and I thought that re- was reflected in the, in the fan vote as well. And again, uh, round two of that fan vote live uh, on Twitter at Around the A Pod. Uh, vote, tell your friends, and uh, have a little bit of fun with this uh, extended off season. Uh, speaking of fun, lots more coming up next week. We're working on getting uh, MVP Jerry Mayhew on the show. Again, if you have uh, uh, guest ideas, topic ideas, uh, questions, or anything, get us via email at aroundtheapod at gmail.com or just uh, you know slide into our DMs uh, at aroundtheapod on uh, Twitter and on Instagram as well. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, that'll do it for episode number 23. Again, thanks to John Hoven and Josh Norris for their time and to you for listening. And we'll uh, talk to you next week on Around the A on the Sports Podcasting Network. Thanks for listening to Around the A. Be sure to tune in again next week. Find Around the A on the Sports Podcasting Network, iTunes, 
Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Interact with us on social media. Give us your thoughts using the hashtag AroundTheA and follow us at AroundTheAPod. 